Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is John Castell with Six Sense. I'm joined today with uh, Rocco, Fiore, and Blaze Fellow from our uh, technical team. We'll be covering a few different topics today. We're going to start off with Blaze. Blaze, you have some information regarding uh, a breach that's actually been occurring for some time uh, called Snowflake. It's been a lot in the news uh, lately as well. Uh, when we talk about supply chain attacks by moving important infrastructure and data uh, offside to the cloud, uh, it makes sense from a business standpoint, but from a security standpoint, obviously we expand that attack surface. Uh, so can we rely on those providers to follow security standards as to what happened, who's affected? How could Snowflake, uh, the breach itself, have been avoided? So could you believe it could be all avoided with some of the just basic security controls in place? So essentially what happened was a group of hackers uh, comprised as many as like 165 customer uh, data cloud storage from Snowflake. They got access to it through a, an employee of Snowflake. And then from that, um, from that credential access through an info stealer malware campaign, they were able to move laterally within the uh, cloud storage to start um, exfiltrating just a ton of data. Um, they're still going on, so they're not sure the full extent of the breach that's happening. So that's why you're still seeing it in the news and why it's reoccurring, why it's something that should still be talked about. And vendors should be held accountable whenever they don't offer the security in place for um, what they are providing. And so um, what I'm talking about in terms of like who's affected some of those big names were like uh, quote wizard uh lending tree ticketmaster i'm sure we all bought a ticket from ticketmaster at least some point um santander and advanced auto parts and some other um big names as well um there's communication still going on with the threat actors saying that they have up to 400 different uh companies to that they can get data um, the other thing that I found that was important is that the communication through that threat actor is not the person that actually exfiltrated the data. So essentially, there's this uh, bigger web of, of bad guys out there where somebody does the initial breach, but then they sell off that um, extra work to a, a third party company within themselves to kind of use the data to exfiltrate more or to extort, extort further. And so with all this information in play, like uh, made known to us, um, how could this have been avoided? Some things that uh, could have just been used and utilized within the environment to make it better would be some basic security controls that come back to something as simple as multi-factor authentication. Um, these kind of checks within the environment can help keep anybody safe, but also it takes time and takes companies a lot of resources to kind of make sure it's out there. But whenever you're talking about insurance and keeping yourself safe for the possibility of exploit or for avoiding exploitation in general, um, some of those basic controls that are in place are the things that can, uh, can prevent some of those things from happening to begin with. Um, so uh, what I'd like to kick out to perhaps Rocco or, or JC is kind of like, what are your thoughts on kind of uh, what can be done to just improve overall security for companies in general? Um, some kind of just basic kind of, um, I don't know, benchmarks or implementation that can just help a company stay up to date with just some uh, basic, basic security controls. Yeah. So I think with this one, obviously, the situation Snowflake's in right now, um, is that all this data, these customer passwords were, you know, out there on the dark web in the hands of who knows what hacking group right now. Um, clearly they got Ticketmaster at some point, which they're going through an antitrust, you know, tobacco with the federal government, the DOJ, and they had this happen. You know, they've been in a lot of news for a couple of things recently. Um, and, you know, every company wants to avoid being in the news with that happening um but you know the passwords are out there so snowflake as you mentioned blaze is basically saying you know it's on the customer now to enforce multi-factor um and any other password uh, safety mechanisms they can on the, the customer side so it's interesting that you know they, they closed their investigation in, internally and everything they know what happened 
Um, but we'll still see this pop up more in the news and the name Snowflake pop up more and more and be attributed to them when they're in fact now saying the onus is on the customer itself. So obviously multi-factor can be done. Mike, you know, the the big, I guess, thought here is for vendors, you know, obviously they don't, maybe multi-factor isn't a default for Snowflake. So should the vendor be taking more, being more aggressive with implementing and enforcing these standards in a situation like when this occurs on the customer side and not giving customer the choice of using multi-factor, right? Not giving them the choice to accept the risk, especially, you know, we could talk about any application from the onset um, of sale to the customer, but especially in heightened circumstances like this, should the vendor rein in more control and make it more than a recommendation on their own application? So, yeah, I think uh, JC might have some more of an opinion on that as well. You can speak to. Yeah, yeah. I guess uh, I kind of just take the final thought on this one. Um, obviously, you know, single factor, if that's what you want to call it, is is completely frowned upon. It has been for well over a decade now, but there's still plenty of services out there that that's all they require uh, to prove your identity. Um, I, I'm I'm definitely for an, an additional factor of authentication. Uh, and phishing attacks are just so common across everywhere. I mean, we look at you know consumer-based sites like Ticketmaster, probably the same people using the same password on 20 other sites that could have equally also been compromised, and, and obviously it was part of the entire attack to begin with. So, um, I, I'm definitely for enforcing MFA only from the standpoint that it proves as well the identity that this person actually exists, that it would actually require, say, a cell phone number. Or, or some additional method to to prove, not biometrics or getting into it that crazy, which I may also be for as well, uh, if uh, if technology can support it, but but definitely ensuring that we're not just relying on a simple password and plain text, but we need additional metrics there. We need additional ways to prove and authorize that these users are who they are um, after, of course, multiple authentication methods. Uh, great topic. Um, I guess this is actually back to you, Rocco, for the next one. Nice. Um, we talk about uh, Scattered Spider. Okay, yeah, this is one that's been popping up in the news, the name Scattered Spider, which um, sounds, I know, it, it sounds very intimidating, right? Hacker Group, Scattered Spider. And we see a lot of these names pop up from time to time. Lockbit um, being an, another one in the news all the time um, for being having been taken down by law enforcement to some extent. But also now, um, I believe today, actually, Lockbit and it was a Federal Reserve hack uh, came out of the news. But keeping the focus on Scattered Spider, if you're not aware, they were the ones responsible for the MGM hack. So, and key part of that hack and what can be attributed to them is it all started with a social engineering mishap. Um, a, I believe it was Okta credentials were given by help desk to someone to uh, someone calling in, right? Um, but interesting part about this timeline so scattered spider recently the leader of scattered spider was taken down by an international law enforcement coalition um he was revealed to be a 22 year old um based in the uk right so in europe um we know that these individuals are easier to reach than the ones that than the groups in in russia so to say and eastern some parts of eastern europe um like lockbit is um, but, you know, a 22-year-old, he his specialty and how he started in cybercrime was SIM swapping, basically just stealing SIM cards out of people's cell phones, grew into being part of a, or leading one of the most notorious and and well-known cybercrime groups, right? So just connecting the dots here um, before I, I pass it over to you guys for your thoughts is, you know, we, this was about a week ago that he was taken down. Um, funny thing, a week before that in the headlines was Scattered Spider was now affiliated with uh, another coalition within cybercrime, Ransom Hub, right? And they also had some disputes or infightings with another group uh, with Black Cat, which was, they were a former affiliate of Black Cat, right? So it's very interesting, the timeline of how things happened. Um, and we know from other organized crime syndicates, a lot of times their downfall is infighting. So it seems like no one's mentioned this, but it really with the timeline of things, it seems like that's what happened here in terms of changes being made in their organization. And all of a sudden, 
literally someone, an anonymous caller called into, I think it was the FBI that kicked off this um, apprehension. So um, do you guys think that's what happened here? If not, you know, what are, what are your thoughts surrounding this incident and cybercrime in general? Well, my thought on is that it somewhat nullifies our previous topic in a way because uh, MFA um, details were actually compromised here as well. Uh, I think it was specifically um, Azure uh, and, and using mm -hmm. SAML access. So, you know, <laughs> just focusing on multi multi MFA alone, you know, again, is, is not really going to get you all that far uh, in this case when, you know, again, you've actually passed that barrier. So, I mean, I don't want to state the obvious is that, you know, we do need to have a better, you know, zero trust mindset and knowing specifically not just the identities, but every surface account, every application, what is it going to communicate with and over what, not just protocols, because that's just a networking facet of it, but what particular ways is every single application part of the stack going to communicate and limiting that. Um, I don't want to get too much into the details, but there's a lot more to it, obviously. Um, so if we just rely on, again, MFA alone, clearly that was not sufficient mm -hmm. in this particular case. Yeah, these groups aren't playing by the same rules that we hope they play by, right? That's what you're saying. So we have to take extra precaution. Absolutely. And my my approach to that would be something like a holistic approach. So if I'm trying to defend against something like that, MFA might be the first um, roadblock or, or security control to protect my users, but it can't be the only thing. Um, I'd like benchmarks set up to make sure something like CIS benchmarks to um, help prevent or create controls where you can't move laterally so easily with um, the uh, least privilege enforced so that if a particular user does get his credentials out there, that at least if it's a basic user, they won't be able to get too much information exfiltrated. But then there's also monitoring that comes on for these longer um these longer uh, exploitation timeframes where you just kind of keep an eye on data that's leaving areas where it shouldn't be leaving and then kind of react accordingly as needed. I mean, in, in simple terms, it's basically when you go through your authentication, you're proving who you are, you're authenticating. You, you can consider that mm -hmm. a variable in terms of how many times you want to authenticate. What are you authorized to see? You're logging into a blank page. If you don't have those actual authorizations, there's nothing that, of course, you can access. And that's what we want to kind of focus on as well. If it's only one particular business function, that should be the one function that you can actually access, even though you authenticated 10 times in a row. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're talking about these, you know, right, these uh, mechanisms that you can put in place to help with, you know, you know, the agenda of these groups and how they operate, like Scattered Spider, right? And the, the group that, the groups that are responsible for Snowflake, right they use more than just one tactic right they use a mix of social engineering um they use a mix of technical um you know some living off the land techniques too not necessarily malware or a trojan horse but once they get into your system simple powershell commands um and that we can deploy these mechanisms to really cut cut down on that so i think we're at the point we're moving on here in topics um jc what's what's the next one yeah so uh Big topic I'm sure many have heard of already. Uh, it's actually been in the news for almost a decade now, uh, specifically Kaspersky. Um, the Biden administration announced plans to ban the sale of Kaspersky Labs antivirus software in the US due to security risks from Russia's influence over the company. Uh, the Commerce Secretary cited the potential for Kaspersky software to steal sensitive, again, this is very much paraphrased, there's a lot more to it, but steal sensitive information or install malware. Um, this move is part of a broader effort to mitigate, obviously, Russian cyber threats, uh, again, perspective from here in the U.S., <clears throat> to restrict Russian entities amid the Ukraine conflict. And it does mark the first time that the Commerce Department has used its authority under actually a Trump administration executive order on securing the information and communications technology and service supply chain. Um, so if we want to get partisan about it, just remember that a lot of rules, of course, get put into play. and They don't get acted upon until later administrations. Um, Kaspersky criticized the decision, of course, attributing it to geopolitical concerns rather than a, an objective assessment of its products specifically, and I, and I probably personally would agree with that. The company plans to pursue legal action, however, to continue operations in the U.S. Commerce Department also added three Kaspersky units to a trade restriction list, limiting their ability to acquire U.S. goods. So for what, what dates are you interested in? The sales ban takes, a place, uh, or takes effect on July 20th. And software updates to customers will end on September 29th of this year. Um, interestingly, as I mentioned, this is nothing really new. Uh, if you paid attention to their product for many years now, 
Uh, the uh, Department of Homeland Security had already banned Kaspersky products um, from federal networks back in 2017 over similar security concerns. Uh, following the initial announcement as well on the 20th of June, they also sanctioned 12 uh, senior Kaspersky executives, emphasizing the commitment to protecting uh, U.S. cyber infrastructure. However, they do not extend to Kaspersky's parent company or, interestingly, its CEO and founder, Eugene Kaspersky himself. The interesting piece that I kind of want to open up here is, uh, again, this is just kind of major public news. This doesn't have much to do with specifically cybersecurity that would be interested around hacks and exploits, uh, but the general public is hearing about this as well. They generated 752 million revenue in US in uh, 2022, serving over 220,000 corporate clients worldwide, including notable companies like Volkswagen, Piaggio, uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, but despite the sanctions and sales ban, Kaspersky has repeatedly maintained that it operates independently of the Russian government. Over the last two decades, um, they have helped, um, and this is what we would, again, the, the, the interesting details, not trying to kind of stir things up, but they did help in the discovery of Stuxnet back uh, in SCADA systems back earlier last decade. Red October used to target embassies and nuclear sites, and even uncovering specifically Russian hacking group Poseidon um, in domestic territory. So I obviously see some pros and cons here, and it you know should probably bolster support for U.S. vendors. Obviously, I've already Googled it and seen clearly right at the very top. I won't mention manufacturer names, but there are campaigns stating we're better, ditch Kaspersky, you go with us instead because of the the, uh, the current climate. Um, <laughs> right, uh, and it's clearly going to have an economic impact, not only the company itself, but my concern here, and this is what I want to open up to you guys. It's thousands of existing customers that are on a tight deadline to rip and replace. Uh, that solution across their fleet. So, you know, what are your thoughts, guys? Um, is it the end of Kaspersky? I, uh, I can take this first right. if you want. I mean, like, uh, I remember back in Geek Squad, um, not a plug at all, but that was probably like 15 years ago or something that I was there. And Kaspersky was one of the top things we recommended. Um, I remember, though, back in that time as well, there was the same topic that was approached about them being tied to the Russian government in some way. So for me, it's kind of interesting that it's taken this long to kind of get to where it is. Um, but we immediately kind of stopped plugging it at the time. But here it is still here. But now we have the government essentially stepping in saying you can't do this anymore. And so I feel like if it's going to be something like that, there should be some. Um, I don't know, benefit offered in or some some agreement where, OK, you can't use this anymore, but here's some funds for getting moved over or something like that. Maybe a tax refund or or, or break or something like that um, to bolster that effort to not only bring more customers to your own region, but to help mitigate the decision that was sort of out of your hands, even if it was for security purposes. Mm hmm. 100%. I think that's a great point. Um, I see some similarities to a number of other situations here. One being actually, you know, TikTok, right? That's one that was a similar conversation of, you know, other, you know, Chinese interests, right? And what do we do about that? Um, and even though I would say TikTok's a lot less essential than Kaspersky is. So <laughs> this might, this situation may even be more needed for Kaspersky, but you know, we know that customers switching over, they, there are people out there that might not even know, be aware that this is happening, right? That's why we have this podcast. But I could definitely see a, a type of um, a type of spinning off of, of possibly their U.S. business um, to be acquired by another company and take on those clients to continue operating um, under new ownership, but still under the Kaspersky banner and the, and the Kaspersky technology, similar how we're seeing is happening with TikTok. Um, so I don't think that those clients are going to be left high and dry. Um, yeah, I think, that's a great point. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Rocco as well. Um, yeah. Next topic, uh, Microsoft's okay. recall of recall. Of course, of course. This is one that's been <laughs> covered by a lot of people and been in the news. So, um, you know, if you haven't heard about it, it's about, it's been about a month now. I believe it's been around um, out there where... Microsoft introduced this new, um, go, it's supposed to be paired with uh, hardware that was released, new AI feature that basically, the way they word it is it takes a snapshot of everything you do and can be accessed locally, which 
we, we it's basically take video it's basically recording you right every second and then it's stored locally which raised a security concern for a lot of people because they said you know we know being stored locally isn't necessarily the the key <laughs> to uh security but if all that data is there it being exfiltrated we could see bad things happening right so um and basically not on top of that what the ai did is it took all of that data it was collecting from you and then converts it picture to text so all that is stored in text what you've done on your computer um and many people see this as a security by by design flaw which it definitely is but you know not so giving microsoft the benefit of the doubt here but Connecting the dots doesn't seem like they totally ditched a security by design manual, as some people are saying, going completely rogue. You know what I, my personal opinion is they had build coming up, right? Major industry event for them. They wanted to release something that had to do with AI fast and maybe a product manager, maybe someone in develop, maybe someone on the product side or whoever it was wanted to get, get this out the door really quick and some oversight happened. So regardless is there any excuse for the reason for ditching any security by design pieces in the playbook but i believe there, there's more to this than them just throwing the manual out the window um and whether they are or not it doesn't matter it still raises a lot of security by design concerns as well as some concerns with new ai regulation coming to heat so in the future, it's going to be a lot harder to rush AI products out the door like this. So um, anyway, in terms of, you know, passing it to you guys and keeping this conversation going, because I know you guys are aware of this. Do you think that Microsoft threw the playbook out the window here or um, is everyone overreacting a little bit? I think they did. Um... Especially, I mean, I, I don't know entirely around the whole situation of how the data was stored, but I mean, mm -hmm. obviously there are concerns that, hey, it's potentially not even encrypted. If you can just get physical access to the device, you have access to the data. Um, I guess it just means that if you're logged in, obviously you can then go back using the same steps that a user would take specifically. Um, I also think that they got more flack given that, I don't know if there was insider information, but Apple Intelligence rolled out around the same time, promising to not actually take the same steps. So clearly it made Microsoft look even worse through a certain lens. Hmm. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, and, and part of me as well, I mean, not to say that I want everything centralized. I appreciate local localized data too, that, uh, mm -hmm. that we can claim to be our own property, but as well, I mean, maybe it would have actually made more sense to offload that into a cloud-based service that is more secure. But then again, that can also be compromised. So not entirely sure what I would recommend personally, but I mean, you know, I see pros and cons there. Yeah, it kind of goes back to our previous conversation too, where government has certain controls or the vendor overlords like Microsoft, Apple have certain controls. And in some cases, maybe like this, it's more important to be first than secure or good or um, even accurate. You know, it comes a lot in journalism too about posting things immediately, but when you have um, you know, security by design in place with something as massively used as Windows, uh, I think it requires you to have a certain different outlook approach than you know, any kind of you know, regular product being developed. But I think everybody should have that to avoid that tech debt that builds up over time and you know, avoid an obvious patch that would be coming anyways. So um, sure. I would think that the se security approach first would be uh how things should be developed just to avoid future problems yeah and um you know to tie this up yeah i think what you're saying you know you kind of hit the nail on the head here it clearly was a business versus security um discussion overall bottom line versus security which is part of the real world but as us and security say goal you know we should be aligned in that right one should feed the other and security by design building security into the entire process is a is a net benefit to the business as a whole and you know we can definitely see that everyone knows that here right so 
Um, not sure what's next because JC is the beholder yeah. of the topics and the MC <laughs> of this discussion. Well, so. one last thought on that as well, which I think is interesting, <laughs> is that AI is obviously a buzzword in almost every industry. In cybersecurity, it's around obviously security and, and hardening it, and making sure that you know it's not this 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 variable that exists that can be completely unlimited to inject malicious code or whatever you know again exploited in some way. And then on the consumer side, hey, we just want our lives to be easier. So that's that trade off, right? Which I totally agree with. Um, Cool. So the next next kind of area, just to, it's kind of more of a recap for me, just to kind of inject some additional uh, updates of what happened in the last month in June. And if you're watching this year from now, June 2024. Uh, so we'll go through some operating system updates, talk about some application updates. I'll go th through this fairly quickly, uh, but just for some items. Now, I know that the topic here, of course, is we're talking about zero days. There weren't really any for this month to start off our, our very first iteration of this webcast. We don't have any zero days to really discuss. Uh, which is, of course, a good thing when you want to think about it. Uh, Microsoft uh, first, for their patch Tuesday, they had 48 fixes uh, for Windows, Windows components, Office, Azure, .NET, Visual Studio, and Power BI. 47 of them were important severity with only one to highlight a critical with regard to Windows message queuing service where exploitations more likely. Apple didn't really have an advisory at all, although I did not check this morning, so let me just double check because they have been known to drop something in literally the minutes that I start a webcast, nothing new. So it's just an update for Vision OS 21 CVEs, no exploitation in the wild. Linux is far tougher to kind of consolidate, uh, far more complex to list out again holistically. So just one particular CVE to highlight in the Linux kernel is CVE 2024-39277 with a CVSS score of 7.8 uh, with confidentiality, integrity, and Availability impacts rated as high. Uh, we will have definitely more information when we see the Oracle's quarterly advisory next month in July. Uh, far more information to dig into, especially the, always the fun one talking about Java. One particular detail, it's not really so much an operating system, but VMware vCenter did uh, receive patches for versions 7 and 8 uh, as they were impacted by two heap overflow vulnerabilities classified as critical in nature. Um, I won't go through the quotes here just for the sake of time, uh, but it was an advisory on June 18th. So if you haven't patched and you haven't been using those services, do make sure that you update. Since they were acquired recently by Broadcom, make sure you go to the Broadcom support portal in case you don't know where to go for that patch. Um, so beyond operating systems, just a few application updates to highlight for today. Um, I'll just throw out some numbers here and focus more on uh, criticality. Adobe did have a single advisory, typically, um, always on the day of Patch Tuesday. That was back on June 11th. 10 products were patched. 166 total vulnerabilities for Windows and Mac OS products. I've been talking about Adobe updates for probably three years now. That might be the largest release, actually. Uh, 10 of those 166 were critical in nature, and 144 were in Experience Manager alone. That is definitely taking the cake. Atlassian uh, patched uh, three products, Confluence Data Center and Server, Crucible Data Center and Server, and then as well Jira uh, Data Center and Server and Jira Service Management Data Center and Server. A uh, number of different vulnerabilities, none critical in nature, but do make sure that you update. It wasn't a large quantity, but they did have CISA advisories. Google Chrome, no zero days. I always talk about it every single month, and it's great we don't have to talk about it. This month, there are only four releases, a number of fixes though, and actually there was a typo. Uh, in the June um, 11th release, 21 fixes, 18 by external researchers, nine were high severity with $68,500 in bounty payout. There was one typo, so I don't, yeah, congratulations to everybody. <laughs> uh, payout's definitely a little bit more now. Um, as of the last, I don't know, I'd say probably since the beginning of the year, I've seen higher payouts than I've ever seen. Um, I don't know if that's due to worldwide inflation, but there might be some more to it. There was one typo where it said, I believe, $100,115. I don't think that's right, considering it was a medium severity uh, vulnerability, but again, um, no disclosed information on the June 13th release, which brings us to June 18th for Chrome, six fixes, four high severity with $27,000 payout. Congrats. June 24th, uh, five fixes, four high severity by secure researchers with uh, 14000 uh, in payout. And just as I always want to do, just double check because they always drop it on the last Tuesday of the month, which is always a surprise for me. They did drop it up. Nope, nope, we're good. That's it. So no additional updates from Chrome. Um, I'm just going to speed these up for the for the last kind of vendors here. Microsoft Edge follows suit, of course, with Chromium code. 
There were three edge-specific vulnerabilities in mid-June on the 13th and two edge-specific vulnerabilities on the 20th, meaning in addition to Chromium updates, there were more as well to fix edge-related issues. There were two uh, releases for Firefox uh, with 15 vulnerabilities patched back on the 11th. Won't go through the rest of the products, but um, there are a number of other applications, of course, that I would recommend. So instead, just to cap that off, rather than list every other vendor that I have uh, for the sake of time, bear in mind that application vulnerabilities are a larger number than operating system vulnerabilities. So know, of course, what's installed in your devices, know what's installed on your home devices, your friends, any consumer, of course, can be impacted by them too. So make sure that they are getting updated just as much as your operating system is, because they will actually be potentially a bigger vulnerability than the OS itself. So on that note, regarding vulnerabilities and some, you know, again, a kind of going back to what I mentioned earlier, an interesting year, Blaze, uh, the National Vulnerability Database, uh, set up, of course, by NIST here in the U.S., has been a sore topic all year. Uh, give us some good news. Has there been any, po have there been any positive developments with a possible ending to the backlog? There actually has. Um, if you haven't been keeping up, which was probably relatively easy the last three months because they hadn't done anything. Um, they recently had a contract with uh, Analogence, as I, how I believe you uh, pronounce it. Um, they were awarded the Vulnerability Assessment and Vulnerability Coordination contract, which supports the Department of Homeland Security and Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency. So DHS and CISA. Um, obviously, um, Analogence is very excited to be part of the uh, that contract so they can start bolstering and expanding what they're offering. Um, they're, they have some really nice things to say about it, but um, the important thing is that they are starting to perform, I think they coined the term vulnerichment. Uh, where they enrich the detections and test them. And essentially, it means they focus on adding common platform enumeration, common vulnerability scoring system, common weakness enumeration, and known exploited vulnerabilities uh, to CVEs. And so they recently enri enriched about 1,300 CVEs, um, and then they continue to diligently work to ensure that all submitted CVEs are enriched. And so that's some good news that we are finally getting that page kind of uh, that database caught up. Um, so with that being said, uh, if you guys have anything else to kind of add to it, but that's pretty much some good news. I'd say that since a lot of people rely on the NVD for scanning capabilities. It's good to see uh, government working efficiently, right? That's, that's what we want. So, <laughs> and working, and working deeper with the private them. private market as well, which is yeah, great to exactly. see. Public, public private partnerships are are massive in terms of everything we're talking about today. You know, cybersecurity. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And then one of the last last topics, um, which uh, many of you probably have heard about, and this is again more public news than it is just specifically security details: the CDK Global Car Dealership Hack. Um, we know very little about the situation at this uh, point. Um, of course, with the group claiming responsibility, uh, it's a new name known for pretty much um, for pretty straightforward TTPs as well as PS exec and Kerber roasting. Rock, could you have more information on that topic? So yeah, so CDK Global was a it's basically an ERP system used by um, you know hundreds, probably a lot of car dealerships, you know, nationwide, worldwide. Um, and they were, they were ransomed, they were shut, yeah, they were ransomed. CDK Global, some news outlets have been reporting that they're planning on paying that ransom, right? Um, the group that's claiming responsibility is a newer name called Black Suit. Fancy, right? Um, but interesting part about that, kind of tying into our Scattered Spider discussion, talking about some of these other um, criminal groups is, they were not known for anything really before like this. You know, they were known for basic TTPs, PS exec, Kerber roasting, breaking into domains and, you know, using living off the land techniques, right? But this is a big jump for them. Um, and just so you kind of know how these, these organizations work, you know, you get a couple ransoms paid out. Now you have the money to go and... It, Ransomware is a service. The way it's broken out, you can go, you can buy exfiltrated passwords, you can buy zero day exploits, right? So this could have been easily, they just, you know, had some funds. They went and bought a zero day exploit from CD, CDK Global, used some of their um, known TTPs. Next thing you know, 
they're getting paid out a nice lump sum from CDK Global. So um, it's interesting because I have some thoughts on this, um, some opinions I'd like to hear from you guys. Do you think that these organizations like CDK Global, right, the software companies, et cetera, tech companies, should be making the call whether to pay the ransom? Obviously, the kind of crippled these car dealerships, not exactly critical infrastructure, but they, you know, we, people depend on these companies for paychecks, et cetera. Or do you think that some act, this action should be more regulated, coordinated with government and officials, regardless of industry, and there should, should be some more, some more players involved in terms of deciding if you're allowed to pay out a ransom outright or not? What are you guys' thoughts on that? Hmm. Blaze, I'll let you... <laughs> It's a tough Just one. One of, um, as I prepared for this topic to talk about previously in, in another webcast, um, I listened to the ransomware files on, it's a podcast. I listen specifically to Spotify and they go through a number of different people and companies that were exploited through ransomware. And you get, see firsthand what it's like to be, um, ransomware. And it's not a fun process as you could hopefully never be part of or imagine, but like there needs, the problem is that it's not going anywhere at the moment with the current trends that we have. Uh, they get payouts based because they we hear about the times that it obviously worked, uh, where they got ransomware and they get paid out. And now it's becoming as a service, you can very easily, the script kitties can get access to something just like you mentioned. And so it's just expanding. When you think of organized crime, maybe your mind still falls back to the old like uh, Godfather movies or something like that. But essentially organized crime is a whole new animal, a whole new beast where it's essentially this new age thing where it traverses the globe and internet where anybody can kind of pick it up and and kind of do something and even with those script kitties they might mean to do something but even cause extra problems even trying to get you the key or something if you do pay out so there's no guarantee um i think it takes it's a gray area of a communication between the both essentially there should probably be a cap allowed to pay out but then you're already you're already exploited. So you're already risking even with whatever payout it is to get the information back. So, um, I mean, it's not an easy decision. So the best thing again is about, um, proactive, uh, controls to, um, you know, to mitigate it or to prevent it to begin with. Yeah. I love what you, I love what you said about global, right? Cause that brings into the question of whose jurisdiction this really is, who's so you know, who's sovereign in this area. And then beyond that, what, you know, applicable, right ransom payout or dealing with criminals right laws come into play so that's a major question and it, it's it's an old you know crime organized crime is, is an old old concept as far as time right but it's in a new way so that's interesting john uh well i think the whole situation is going to impact the economy more than people may think because let's just <laughs> think back to the beginning of the pandemic that well i should say shortly after the pandemic the used car market uh, specifically hit, you know, something that was unprecedented is that values went up and spiked, right? And then skyrocketed. And then as well, new car sales as well, were actually on hold. I couldn't buy a forerunner for a year and a half because of a microchip issue or semiconductor issue um, across the world. Um, so, you know, th there was a, an interesting case there. So the last four years, I think this is going to kind of go in the history books, especially with 15,000, I think total dealerships were impacted by this. The consumer obviously has hit the most because personal information was released. Um, the business itself is probably going to go under, as I understand, they're now being sued by many. Uh, so it will be obviously a class action suit. Whether I feel for your question, Raka, that um, uh, there should be regulation around it. I think when it comes to cybersecurity, I'm more open to regulation my, myself. This is, again, more of my personal opinion than anything. Um, but, it, you know, again, there is that kind of gray area. You know, where do you kind of stand on that from considering that, hey, this is a private market, obviously, issue, but it is impacting additional businesses, um, specifically mm -hmm. with the supply chain. So it's, yeah, I'm not 100% on it, but it's very interesting. And I, I'm, I think we should talk about this as well next month. I think it's a great topic to monitor. Mm -hmm. We'll probably have more information, obviously, a month from now uh, to see how things pan out over the next 30 days or so. Cool. Um, we're at time, so appreciate. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you, Blaze and Rocco, for for all of your points today. Um, and, of course, uh, uh, the discussion. This was great. For everybody else, thank you as well for attending. I hope that this has been informative and useful. 
Every day, the Sixth Sense team identifies, classifies, and pre-checks various patches and vulnerabilities that affect common endpoints and servers. If you'd like to get a full listing of all the various issues that may impact your environment, be sure to check out our website under resources. You'll see a link to our public vulnerability database. If you have any further questions, concerns, or suggestions for improvement, obviously as well, we would love to hear it. Thank you for your time, and we'll see you next month.